Well, uh, thanks very much. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here. It should be fun. In fact, that was, um, I think someone near there asked the question about what to do. And I'm going to give you a $20 bill later. Because um, it was I, like I should, if I had thought to offer that to somebody, I would have, but I didn't. So, I'm, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to make good on that. So, so today, what I'm going to uh, talk about is um, actually a couple of topics uh, I'm going to I'm going to cover. Uh, the first is going to be I'll talk about convex optimization. So, you might know about convex optimization. You might not. You might not. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit at the highest level about what it's about. It does play a very big role in uh, machine learning. Um, and so I'll talk about that, and then we'll uh, segue from there. I'll show you a couple of things you can do with it. Uh, and then from there, at the end of the talk, I'm going to show you a little bit that directly asks, that answers this question of how do you build a model uh, from data that's stored at disparate locations, right? And how do you do that in a coherent way that kind of that'll actually work? And that's that's what I'll show you. Um, so this is a lot of what I'm going to talk about is joint work with a lot of people, but in particular, uh, a lot of it is with a student of mine, Stephen Diamond, who is somewhere uh, here. Um, so I guess he's back there. I think that was him. At least there's someone waving back there. Who, uh, so um, OK, so uh, I'll, I'll jump into this. Um, and like I said, what I'll do is first, I'm just going to cover the idea of just what is convex optimization. And you know, don't worry, it won't be too detailed. But, and, and I'll go over why you should care about it. And then what we'll do is we'll, I'll actually show you some uh, model methods for model fitting using convex optimization. Um, they're all kind of well known, the methods I'm going to show you, but in smaller segments of the population. And these are things I think everyone should know about and probably everyone should use. So these may even be useful. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of consensus optimization and model fitting. Uh, that'll be the main thing I'm going to talk about. So. OK, so let's start with what's convex optimization. Well, it's a mathematical optimization problem. And that looks like this. Uh, you have a variable that you're going to choose. That's, that's x. It's, a, it's an n vector. These could be, for example, the parameters in a model of some data, for example. You have an objective. That's f0 of x. That might be some measure of how well your model fits the data that you have. Uh, it could be also other terms, like regularization. You have some constraints. And you have uh, some inequality constraints and equality constraints. Now, the, what makes this problem uh, convex is the following. The curvature of the objective and the constraint inequalities is positive. It's non-negative. So that means they curve upward. They have positive curvature. That's the key. Um, so, and that just means that they satisfy this inequality. And the equality constraints have to be linear. So that's a convex optimization problem. And you could well be asking yourself, I mean, you could be thinking to yourself, I've never seen one. You know, who would care? I think that'll, I'll make that clear, right? So, so the question is, what, you know, why should you care about this? Um, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, they are, uh, I mean, the first one is this. It's really simple. We can solve them. They can be solved. That's actually very important. Um, I mean, you can solve all sorts of optimization problems, but if you mean by solve, not really solve. Right, so meaning you apply gradient descent and you get something that's better, right? I mean, that could work for your purposes. But in this case, I mean, like, we solve it. We get the actual answer. There, it's reliable. There's no babysitting. You know, you don't have to tweak parameters and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, you can actually really solve them. And that's coupled with this. There's just tons of applications, right? So together, I think it's a very compelling thing to know about. Um, in fact, my feeling is it should be in the toolbox of anyone who does any kind of numerical computations should know about this topic. It's kind of like linear algebra or knowing about, you know, uh, singular value decomposition or PCA. It's just a, it's, to me, it's a very basic thing. So what are some application areas? Well, there's machine learning, statistics. Uh, I mean, these are, it's, it's everywhere in these areas. Um, but it comes up in finance, supply chain, advertising, control, signal and image processing, vision. Lots of areas like this, right? So it comes up in, in lots and lots of areas. Um, let me say a little bit about um, how you solve them. Um, so if you have a medium scale problem, and that's a problem typically with you know, a couple of thousand variables, maybe a couple of tens of thousands of variables and constraints, this, we can do this on a single machine. I can do this on my laptop. Uh, well, it's a new laptop, so anyway. But I can do it on my laptop. It's not a big deal. Um, if you get to larger scale, that might be 100,000 to a billion variables or more. 
Um, and in this case, they're usually solved these days by custom methods, right? It's custom for that specific thing, right? So if you're, if you're fitting a logistic regression model of something, you'd use custom code if it's at this scale, right? Um, now, there's lots of ongoing research about how you solve these problems, uh, but one cool thing is that there's a growing list of open source solvers, right? So more and more of these problems are in an area where you can just get code and solve it, right? It's by no means done, but it's actually in quite good shape right now and getting better every day. Now, one very cool uh, thing, and this is actually very important for people whose primary interest is not the optimization, but actually doing something with it, this is a very important development. It's maybe about five years old or something like that, but it is also, it's something that, like many other things, goes back decades, if you actually look into it. And the idea is to have a modeling language uh, for convex optimization. And this is how most people will do and will interact with these ideas and methods, right? So what it is is you have a, you have a high level language that describes optimization. And what you do is you describe your problem in a high-level language, and then that's automatically compiled to a standard form. And then it's solved uh, then by some standard form solvers, right? Um, now, there's several implementations of this, right? There's, uh, there's something called YALMIP. Uh, that's a, a kind of a weird uh, reference. It's yet another, I think, LMI preprocessor, which is a reference to YAC or something like that. CVX is one of the first very widely used ones. That's, th these are unfortunately in MATLAB, but they're, they're very, very widely used. So I, I did apologize, right? So it's fine. Um, a, a, uh, there, there have been a, a couple of ones, but CVX Pi uh, was written by Stephen, who we believe is, there he is, okay, so he is actually here. This time he stood up, so I knew it was him. So, um, so that's CVX Pi. It's a Python implementation of this. And there's several others, right? There's, uh, there's one in Julia that's convex.jl. And there's a project just started to bring these things to R. So, but don't, don't hold your breath. But we'll, we'll see how that works. OK. So what does it look like? Well, this would be a snippet of CVX Pi, right? So, and that would look like this. You want to solve this problem. Now, who knows why, right? But well, parts of it make sense. That's a least squares objective. And you add an L1 regularization. And then uh, for some reason, you believe that all of these coefficients have to be between plus and minus one. I mean, this is just made up, right? Oh, actually, it's a good thing made up, because if the problem were just this, this would be a standard lasso problem. And you could find all sorts of custom codes that would be quite efficient, and there'd be no reason to do this, right? But in this case, for some reason, you want to add that constraint. And so you would simply write this. This would be the, the Python source that would, uh, that would specify and then solve that problem. So here, you would declare x as a variable. Uh, so that's an object of, you know, from the class variable. You'd form this expression, which is the cost. That's this thing. Um, then you would construct a problem object. And so that would have, uh, an ex it would have an objective, which is minimize the cost. And then it would have a list of constraints. And in this case, it just has one, it has one constraint, which is simply the infinity norm of x is less than or equal to 1. You, you construct the problem, and then you simply call the solve method on it. And that has, what that does is as a side effect, that will write on the value attribute of the variables. In this case, there's only one variable, one vector variable, x. And so this, as a side effect of calling the solve method, this would be overwritten with whatever the numerical value is, right? So this, so, and the idea is that this is actually how most people will use these optimization methods, right? So you don't need to know, you know, you know, people, I mean, we'll, I'll, I'll give talks and I'll show examples and people, people will say, well, how'd you do that? Did you use, use conjugate gradients, didn't you? Or you used, you know, gradient descent. And I'll, I'll just look at them and say, it's none of your business. It's, you know, all I can tell you is we solved it, it got the answer, and it's actually none of your business how we did it, right? So, which is actually the correct answer in some sense, right? So, okay. So we're going to look at some examples just for fun. And you may have seen some of these examples before. They're, they're, not, they're not new. I mean, these are things that are, in some cases, you know, a decade or more old. Um, but it's just if you just want to see, like, OK, like, what, what can you do with this, right? So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And the first one is image in painting. And so this is, you have a, I have an image. So an image is given uh, by a bunch, uh, you know, an m by n array of pixel values. And each pixel value is a three vector. It's for r, g, and b. Right, so I have, so that's what this looks like. I have a whole bunch of pixel vectors, which are the RGB encoding of each pixel value. And in image in painting, what happens is I have an image, 
but a bunch of the pixels are missing. You don't know the values, right? So, and your, your job is to paint them in, is to actually guess what they might have been. And of course, what matters is that you do this in a way that, they, that, it, that the image looks good. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, it, it's not hard to imagine how you should do in painting. If you're missing a pixel, but you have all the neighbors, you should look at the neighbors, and it shouldn't be far from the neighbors or something, and you could make something that would do something. It wouldn't be very hard to figure something out. Um, but we're gonna see how easy it is to do actually a shockingly good job just using convex optimization. So what you minimize is something called a total variation. And what this is, is you, uh, here you stack, uh, that's a six vector, it's got six components, and what you're doing is you're stacking the horizontal difference and the vertical difference. So this vector here is actually, an it's, a, it's a discretized approximation of the gradient in the image. But that's in three colors, right? So it's a gradient in three colors. That's the gradient. And you minimize the sum of the norms of these. And here's actually a very important point. Um, if you're trained in kind of classical mathematics or you know, computation, you would have an overwhelming urge to put a two right up there, right? Because you'd minimize the sum of the squares, right? And, and the reasons for that would be many. I mean, one would be you might imagine that this is easier computationally. You might, and you might be, tr you might be right, but it's unlikely. Um, it's traditional, you know, blah, blah, blah. You could mumble things about Gaussian and stuff, and that justifies the square. I mean, there's all sorts of things you could do, right? But it's very important here that this is not, this is actually not squared. It's the sum of the norms. Um, by the way, the norm has a sharp point at the bottom, because if you think about what a norm is, right at zero, it's not differentiable. And so a lot of people, classical optimization, would look at that and say, no, no, you can't do that. And you'd say, why? You go, because it's not differentiable. It's got that sharp point. It turns out the sharp point is precisely why this works well. Okay, so that's a convex optimization problem. It does not have an analytical solution, but we can solve it. So let's look at an example. So here's, here's Lena. Uh, and here's the original image here. Um, and then what's happened is uh, we've simply removed. Uh, we is to be understood. I imagine you would know this as Stephen, uh, right? Okay, so just, I just, when a professor speaks and we say we, that means graduate students. So anyway, so just, I, I just wanted to make it clear. I just, just, just to give you the idea, right? So, yeah, if you were ever a graduate student, you would know this, right? So, but, but I think people who don't know about that, some, they'll say we, I'll say we, 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 and stuff like that. And they don't, later people would say, well, that's amazing. I'm like, oh, I didn't do that. Anyway, so, all right, fine. So here we've taken the original one, and we've removed a bunch of the, the pixels. So everywhere where you see these white, these, these white things, the, the, the white characters, we've just removed the pixels, it's just gone. So they're gone. And so your job now is to fill in the pixels that are missing, okay? By the way, if you do a crappy job, I mean, what, some things are clear. If you're up here where, you know, all around you, all, all the RGB values are about the same, you should fill it in with that. I mean, duh, right? But the point is here, it's not, it's not obvious, you know, what do you do like on an edge here? And if you do a crappy job, you're gonna see artifacts. Artifacts are, you know, you'll actually still see a shadow of the characters, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve that problem. That is gonna take exactly like, uh, you know, three or four lines of Python. Um, and this is what's gonna happen. This is, that's the recovered one, okay? So um, there's silence. I hope that's because you understood what just happened. Um, <laughs> And it's really impressive. If you don't think it's impressive, then I guess you don't get what really just happened. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's, let's just, to make it clear, right, what's happened is for every one of the, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand pixels in there, or maybe, a, I don't know, 150, 80,000 pixels, we chose an RGB value simply in a really simple way by just minimizing this convex function, right? And the result was this, and it looks like Super good. By the way, it's not the original. This is not the same as that. You can take the difference and you'll see it's, it, it, they're not the same. They're, of course it's not the same. You can't figure out what the pixel values each, that have been obscured are. What you can do is you can fill it in in such a way that it looks very natural, okay? So it's pretty stunning. And then you, you look at this and you go, wow, that's kind of amazing. Like, well, how far could you push it? And here's a good, so here's one where you just remove, you keep one in five pixels. And now, by the way, this would separate the amateurs from the real thing, right? The, in this case, it's a lot. This is no longer, everybody knows if you're filling in a pixel and everybody around you has a kind of an RGB value, fill it in. I mean, duh, right? Uh, that won't work here, 
Okay? And so here's what happens when you run the same code on it. Um, yeah. Not me. This is, this, is, this is maybe 10 years old or something like that, and I didn't, I didn't do it. In fact, I can even say we didn't do it. Um, so, uh, okay. So, now, by the way, there are artifacts here, but on the other hand, you're like, excuse me, 80% of the data was missing. So it's actually, for that, it's pretty good, I, I think you'd have to say. Okay. So, okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a few minutes, and we're going to go over some examples in model fitting. Um, and so, actually, there's two reasons I'm going to do this. First, I want to convince you that convex optimization like, is good for model fitting. It's actually really good. Uh, but what's cool about it, it's not just that a lot of the things you've been doing, like logistic regression, support vector machine, lasso, it's not just that these are convex optimization, but you can do, once you're, you get this idea, you can do stuff that is actually amazing with it. And I don't think enough people are doing it. So I'm going to show you a couple of those examples. OK. So quickly, I'm going to go over what the setup is. So the setup is we're going to be given a data, and those are going to be pairs of a feature vector and an outcome or label. And the idea, of course, this is just standard stuff. We're going to make a predictor, and a predictor is going to be some function psi, um, and that's going to make y hat, and then we would like y to be about equal to y hat. And if the data, if the label is like a, a, a real number, this is like a regression model, right? And if it's a Boolean, uh, then this is a classifier, right? So this is kind of standard stuff. And the question is, how do you come up with uh, this this function psi, right? Well, there's, a, there's actually a very standard way to do this um, that plays very nicely with convex optimization. And that's this. What you do is your, your predictor is going to be parameterized by a vector theta. So those are the coefficients in your predictor. And you're going to have a loss function. And the loss function tells you, it tells you this is the loss. This is, tells you how bad it is to fit the data point xi, yi with the parameter theta, OK? Um, and the predictor, once I know what theta is, the predictor is going to be really simple. I'm going to get my x, and then I'm going to look at all of my possible outcomes y, and I'm going to take the one that gives you the lowest loss. Very, very simple, right, and natural. And then it all comes down to this. How would you choose this parameter theta? Because theta then tells you what your predictor is, right? And you do this by... It's very simple. It's, again, it's completely natural. What you do is you have some data. That's x, i, y, i pairs. Uh, that's a, a, of size m. And what you do is you look at the average loss. Now you consider this a function of theta. And then you minimize that plus lambda times a regularizer, right? And the regularizer, it penalizes model complexity, enforces constraints. It can, it can try to make your model sparse. It can do all sorts of stuff. And in fact, that's kind of what the art is about. Um, and then lambda simply scales regularization. If you make lambda bigger, whatever this is doing, uh, like making theta small, more of it will happen. OK, so this is the method. And all, this all together, actually, this very simple general scheme generates a whole lot of, of problems. They are all convex. I mean, this is typically convex in almost all cases. Well, OK, there's one huge exception, which you'll hear about and have heard about and will hear about again. Um, OK, but let's look at some examples. If your, uh, you can have least squares. That just says that your loss is simply the, uh, that's your prediction minus your, your uh, actual value squared. Uh, no regularizer. You can have ridge regression. That's, that's uh, ordinary regression, but we also penalize the size of theta. You could have lasso. That's least squares and then an L1 regularizer, and then that'll tend to sparsify your vector. It'll mean that your vector's going to be, have a lot of zeros in it. And that really means it's doing feature selection, right? So. You can combine these two, and that's called like elastic net. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, logistic classifier, uh, support vector machine, all of these things work. And every single one of them leads to a convex optimization problem, every single one. Now, you might ask, so what? And I would, I'll tell you the honest answer to the fact that all of these things are convex optimization problems right now. Uh, the honest answer is it doesn't matter in practice, right? Because these, these estimator methods are so widely used that people have implemented special purpose code to solve them. And so you're in good shape. You just use one of those. I mean, that's what you use. You don't have to use some general purpose convex optimization stuff. OK. But now I'm going to show you a couple of things that are not widely known. And actually, if you wanted to start paying attention, this would be a really, really good time. Uh, because. I'm actually going to tell you something that's used. So far, it's all like just, OK, that's cool. Now I know that these are all the same. Now you're actually going to hear about stuff that's actually, this is actually useful, this part. So, OK. 
So here's one thing. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is sort of some fields know about it. Most don't. Most people have never even heard of this. And it looks like this. You take anywhere where you would use your least squares, uh, your least squares loss function. Now, if you think about what least squares loss says, it says basically if you're wrong a little bit, you don't care much because it's squared. You know, if, you're, if your error is small, then error squared is very small. Um, but the problem with least squares is if your error is big, it's big squared. Uh, and that says you really care about it. It means your model will go way out of its way to fit an outlier if you have it. And that's, of course, going to lead to terrible model performance, right? So something that goes back to the 60s is, uh, is the Huber function. And the Huber function is really cool. It's just least squares and then up to some threshold value m, and then above that it transitions to just linear, right? So, uh, so what it means is for a Huber loss function, you still care about making mistakes, about being wrong. But if, you're, if you have a big error, you care a lot less with Huber than you do with least squares. And that says if you have some outliers, a Huber fit is actually going to be way, way better, way better in practice, okay? So, Again, this is used by some people in some areas, but it hasn't, this idea has not diffused anywhere near far enough, in my opinion. Well, in this case, my opinion is correct, so, uh, but still, okay. So we're gonna look at an example, um, and it's just a baby example. It wasn't tuned to do anything. It's just like the first example you come up with, it, it shows it, it's perfect. So we have 300 regressors we're gonna guess. 450 measurements, and what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to generate it from, the true, from a true distribution, so that's cheating, but you know, that's, that's what it is. It works extremely well in practice as well. And then we're going to do something very evil, uh, and let me, let's talk about outliers very briefly, right? If you have a data set and you have uh, an outcome that is all of a sudden 10 to the 8 times bigger than all the others, you know it's an outlier. You know that a bit, a bit got flipped and everything, so it's obvious, right? Anybody could filter things that are way, way out, like that's obvious, right? If your outlier is, you know, if it's just like, if you flipped a slow order bit, I'm sorry, a low order bit, but a, a high order bit, right? So that in fact, uh, well, it depends what was high and low, but anyway, sorry, if you fit, uh, uh, if you flip something that changes the fourth significant, uh, significant figure in your outcome, that's not going to have any effect at all. So it's going to be harmless. So here, here are the outliers that you need to worry about. You need to worry about outcomes that are plausible and completely wrong. So those are the ones you want to worry about, okay? So here, we are generating plausible outcomes that are completely wrong, and we do that this way. If you work out what happens here, each of these has a distribution, uh, like a Gaussian distribution. That means if you flip the sign, it's got the same distribution. So there's no way you could tell. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be way out at you know, 10 to the eight times bigger. It's the same distribution, it's completely evil, right? So that's it, this is the, so that's what we do. And you do this for, with probability p. So 5.05 means 5% of the measurements are not just wrong, they're plausible and completely wrong, right? So, okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just run uh, Huber and we're gonna run least squares, right? Oh, and we're also gonna compare this to a prescient version. A prescient version means that somebody's gonna sneak up to you and tell you exactly which of the measurements have been flipped. And that way you can flip them back. And of course, obviously you can't do better than that. Okay. So, Here's what happens. This is P. That's the number of data points that you, that you, swip, you just swap the sign on it, and it's, it's like just completely wrong. So what happens is P goes from 0 to like 15% here. And this is what happens with least squares. And this is, this is an error in identifying, this is a fractional error in identifying uh, the parameter. Now, you know, this is hardly surprising that least squares gets messed up by flipping the sign on some of your measurements. I mean, of course it is, right? But here's the really crazy part. This is 0 0.07, 0 0.08. Up, up to 8% of the data, you flip the sign, and the Huber thing is just sailing right through it. So you have to think carefully about what's being shown here. Once again, if you get what's being shown here, you should be very impressed. Right? This is no tuning, nothing. This is just you swap out instead of least squares, you do Huber minimization. Okay. Uh, so, and by the way, I, this is of course all synthetic, but I should add these things work extremely well in practice in the right situations, right? So, um, actually what's weird is that you're actually doing so well it's a bit spooky. Um, this is how well you do if someone told you which of the measurements had been flipped. So you could secretly flip them, you could flip them back and then do least squares, right? And what this says is, 
at the point where, you know, 4% of your measurements are not just wrong, but actually in a very evil way wrong. This is somebody intentionally trying to mess with you. You're actually just powering right through it. So, okay. So, um, it's impressive. And it was nothing more than swapping out squ for least squares. We use a Huber one, okay? So, all right. The next thing we're gonna talk about, the second example of this, and the examples are, you know, how do you use convex optimization to do good model fitting, right? So now we're gonna look at quantile regression. This is reasonably well known, um, so, but it's not used enough. I think it's kind of cool. It goes like this. What we're gonna use is we're gonna use uh, a loss that, is a, uh, that looks like that, right? So it's linear on both sides of zero. And if I make them the same like that, you just get an absolute value, but I can tilt it one way or another like that. And that's a, that's a tilted L1 penalty, and that's controlled by this parameter tau between zero and one. Um, and for example, if tau equals 0.5, the interpretation is you have an equal penalty for overestimating or underestimating, right? And if tau is, let's say, 0.9, it means, it means basically there's nine times more penalty for underestimating than overestimating, okay? And it turns out you can show, uh, and the reason it's called quantile regression is because when you do regression with this loss function, the tau quantile of the residuals is zero, right? So for example, you could make a 90% quantile fit you could make a median fit and a 10% quantile. Actually, my opinion, again, is you should do something like this. For a lot of applications, you should be making three or five predictors. So that when someone says, what's that number? You can say, I've got five. You want the best one? Here's my guess. But I'm actually gonna give you the 10th percentile estimate, the first quartile. I'm gonna give you the 90th percentile and the 95th. And that way, if those things are like real close, that means you are rather confident in your prediction, and if they're spread apart, it means you're not, right? So, okay. So we're gonna do an example of this. We, again, means Stephen, but uh, okay. So we'll do it, and what it is is this. We're gonna take a time series, so we have a, a xt for t equals zero, one, two, and we'll just make an auto-regressive uh, regressive predict. I mean, we can do anything, all sorts of fancy things. We're just gonna make an AR model, nothing more. And what we'll do is we'll take, we'll, we'll do, we're going to make an AR model based on the last 10 uh, samples in the time series, and based on that, we're going to predict the next one. Okay. So we're going to use, we'll make three quantile uh, models using the quantile regression. And so these are actually three separate models. This is not one model, and we vary it. We're making three, they're quite separate models. We're going to see that shortly, right? And so what it says is that at each point in this time series, the last thing you just saw was XT and you're asked, please predict xt plus one, and you're gonna make three predictions, and they're gonna be a, a 10th percentile prediction, a 90th, and a, and a median, okay? And that's gonna be, that's gonna, actually in some applications, that's gonna be super duper useful, because if this one is way bigger than that one, or if these two are very close and that's really big, that means that's telling you something very important. What it's telling you is that, uh, you know, there's, there's some upside, there's some, there's some risk on, on, your, on x, t, x hat t being much bigger than you think, okay? So here's the time series. I think we generated it from some simple nonlinear model. So there's the time series, and you wanna predict, in each of these, you wanna predict the next step given the last 10. And we're, and we're just using linear models, very simple. You could use a fancier model, it wouldn't matter. And here's what happens. So remember, we're making three predictions. We're predicting the 10th percentile, the median, and the 90th percentile. Um, by the way, they don't actually have to, you sometimes, weirdly, the 90th percentile could be less than the 50th percentile. It's rare, but it can happen, right? So, and you can see this is what it does. And you see, I mean, this, on this plot, you can see it looks like it's doing pretty well, but we're gonna zoom in just to see what it looks like more closely, and this tells you a lot. Um, so the black curve in here, that's here, that is, that's the actual data. And then the, the blue, the green, and the red are the three predictions. One is the low prediction, the 10th percentile prediction. One is the 90th percentile. And if you look at it, it kind of does the right thing. Here's the cool thing to look at. If you go way down here, you'll see that the gap between the 90th percentile prediction and 10th is very small. And that's, by the way, correctly indicating that your prediction is going to be good. If you go up here, you see the gap is much bigger. And here, what that's telling you is that, in fact, your prediction is not good, and that's even, and that's correct. Everybody see how this works? So, okay. Um, and you can do things like look at the residuals here. Uh, for example, 
Here, you can look at the residuals, and you'll, you'll find out that, for example, the green one on the training set comes out exactly at 50%. The red is exactly here uh, at the, at the uh, 10%, and the blue is exactly at the 90th percentile, and that persists on the test set, uh, not just the training set. Okay. All right. What we're going to do now is get into the last topic, which is just consensus optimization and model fitting. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Well, what it is, is you want to solve a problem that looks like this. You want to minimize a function, which is a sum of terms. Now, if you want to have a real, if you want to make a very specific idea of what this is, x, let's make x a parameter in a model, in a data model, and let's let fi be the loss function for the ith block of data, right? So I have a bunch of servers, each sitting on a petabyte of data or whatever it is, it doesn't mean a lot, is the idea. And what I want to do is I want to make a common, I would like, in principle, what I'd love to do is collect all the data in one place, then minimize the loss, and I get a common model for everything. That's what I'd like to do. All right. Um, but we're going to do something that first looks really weird and silly. It's this. We're going to put this into a special form, and it goes like this. You take this problem here, and you rewrite it this way. And the, the subtle difference is instead of having just a single common vector x here, you're allowing each of these sub-problems to have their own opinion. Right? So here it's f of x, a common model, say, if we're doing modeling. And here, each there's xi. That, that's, you interpret that as, the, as you know, agent i's opinion of what the model should be. OK? So everyone can have their own opinion. That's the good news. But then you, in, you add a constraint that says, however, all opinions must agree. So this is the, and this doesn't, when you, when you do this, it, just, it doesn't look like this is going in a good way, right? I mean, so what? Uh, so it turns out, actually, you can now solve this using methods that go way back. I mean, there's some, it's called ADMM. It's got other names like Douglas Rackford, operator splitting. And the history of this traces all the way into the 50s. Not that anyone in the 50s would recognize this application. But nevertheless, I could make a strong argument that these ideas have gone all the way back to the 50s. And you end up with an amazing algorithm. It's very simple, completely interpretable. And it goes like this. It says that. The way you're going to do this is that you're going to maintain, that's the opinion of the parameter x at, at uh, you know, data store i, right? And it says you're going to minimize the loss. Well, that's obvious, the local loss, plus, and then it's simply this quadratic. And all the bits of that quadratic make sense. One is uh, you're going to do this. At each iteration, you're going to pull all of everyone, and you're going to ask, what, what do you think xi should be? And you're going to average, and that's going to give you uh, your, that's going to be sort of the global opinion at iteration k, x bar k. This says, you know, please minimize your local loss, but please don't move far from the average. That makes perfect sense. And then there's this other curious variable here, u. But then you look at what u is, and u is this. xi, k plus 1, that's the opinion of the i uh, subsystem, minus the average. This is how much agent i disagrees with the average. That's how much agent i is out of consensus with the average, OK? This is the error. This says that u is the running sum of the errors. Now, if you know about control, this is called integral control. It's a very famous method. You just take, you know, that's, that's in fact, I'm, I'm sort of in control, so I'm allowed to make fun of the field. But I mean, that's kind of the main point of control, is that the, the summary of like all of 20th century control is you don't just look at the error. You look at the integral of the error, and then things work way better. So OK. Um, so this is, the, this, is, this is it. Here's what's cool about this. Um, this method here, uh, I'll tell you the theory of it. Um, if the fi are convex, uh, this method simply works, period, always. So there, there are no exceptions. It just works. It might be slow, you know, but that's another question, but it works. OK. Now, when you transcribe this to the problem of fitting a model, it's super cool. So it looks like this. Your parameter is the variable's theta. And what it is is what you do is each of these is the local, is basically the local cost. And then it's beautiful because what happens is in each iteration, each of these things minimizes a local loss. In other words, if you fit the model based on your local data, then you coordinate with this quadrat, additional quadratic term. And that, that's, how, that's how they all go into consensus, and they all come up with the same model. Um, and the idea is that all these primers are going to converge to consensus, and that's as if you'll get the same answer as if you had collected all that data in one place, which is actually kind of amazing, because no data moves. Then 
I mean, you could say that this is privacy preserving because what happens is you just have to support a method that goes like this. I send you the global model, you do computation on your local data, and you send me back your updated model. That's this thing here, right? Um, so this is, uh, I mean, I would call it privacy preserving, but my colleagues in computer science who have formal definitions of privacy preserving, they, get, they go nuts and they go, that is not privacy preserving, you know, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't meet any of the requirements. But it would seem to me in practice it's quite close to privacy preserving as a practical question. Right. Okay. We're going to look at a baby example. Um, and the baby example is going to be a support vector machine. It's tiny, right? So we're going to look at a support vector machine with two features and 400 examples. Now, I can solve that on my laptop in about 80 microseconds, that problem, but let's just, this is just to see how this works. Um, it worked to make it not, what we're going to do is we're going to split the groups, the, the 400 examples into 20 groups in the worst way. We're going to have a Maxwell demon, and the Maxwell demon is going to take all the positive examples and they're going to lump them into groups of all positive and all negative, right? So the point about that is that each of the 20 agents is going to see 20 data points, and they're all going to be positive or all negative, and that means that each one has an incredibly skewed view of the world. They have to coordinate to get a model. Okay, so here's what they look like. These, the, these are the data, and all the dashed lines are the original, the, the agent models, and they're terrible. Well, duh, because each one, we gave a very skewed view of the world. Each, each one saw only all positive or all negative. Okay? And that's, the, that's, that's the, the consensus one after one step. You run ADMM five iterations, and it looks like that. And you run it 40, and you're there. Now, of course, it's not impressive, because it's, I could have solved the original problem in 80 microseconds or something, right? What's cool about this is to just think about what happened here. What happened here is I have 20 independent boxes, each sitting on data. None of them has any idea how many other boxes there are there. Each one supports one method which is simply that the average goes in, they do private computations, and they say, oh yeah, if that's the average, here's, here's my updated estimate. They've been pulled together. They've been pulled together to the model you would get had you collected all the data in one place. I mean, I think it's kind of cool. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a, a CVXPy implementation. This is done by, by Stephen. And again, it's not a huge problem but by any means, but it's not small either. I mean, so we're going to take a, a, a dense uh, SVM model, a, a SVM problem. You drop it into 100 chunks, and then you run this on 100 processes on 32 cores, and it takes a, a while. Now, it takes for the objective to converge, it actually takes 100 iterations. But now what's really cool is it takes only 10 iterations before you get a good model, right? This is the dirty secret of model fitting. I'll say that in a minute. And you get a picture that looks like this. So this, this blue line is the objective, and it's going down eventually to, I think, about that number. Um, and that's the objective. That's the loss plus the regularizer. But of course, what you care about is, of course, how well you do on the test data. And that's the red curve here, right? And what's interesting about this is within 10 iterations, you have produced a model that's as good as you will ever get, OK? So, and this is the, dirt, of course, this is the dirty secret of model fitting, is that Someone says, how, you know, what are you doing? I'm fitting a model. How are you doing it? I'm minimizing this, you know, loss plus that, blah, blah, blah. And they'd say, oh, do you have to do a good job? And the honest answer is, no, you don't, right? So, but, no, well, it, jo your job is this, right? That's the surrogate, right? So, oh, by the way, that's not an endorsement of being sloppy, you know, but it just says that there's some slop, there's, you, you have some margin here. And the final thing I'll show is just a, a quick uh, implementation that uh, Tomas uh, Nicodem did in H2O, right? So this is just something derived from a Kaggle data set. It's got 20,000 features, 20 million examples. It's got logistic loss, elastic net regularization. The data is divided into 100 chunks and then run on 100 different uh, H2O instances. Um, and then, again, in this case, it took 20 iterations to get a good global model, right? And again, what you want to think of is what's actually happening here. This is not some new method to solve something faster. It's a way to do it without moving the data. And so what's actually happening, the way you really want to think about this is 100 stores of data. Each one has no idea how many others there are. They each do something independently. They exchange messages. And after 20 steps, they have the same global model as if all the data had been collected in one place and you'd solved it, right? So, um, and this is the way that looks like. So these, this is going to be the ultimate ROC curve that you get in your classifier. Um, 
the, there's a big gray band here. Those are the 100 local models, and the dark line shows you the, the average. So this is iteration one. They're terrible. All of this area here is, you know, is bad classification, right? Here you are at two iterations. Here it is at three, and five, and 10, and at 50, okay? And so, and again, the point is not that this is not some way to speed this up. What this means is that we have actually fit a model with 100 sources of data, and we moved no data from one place to another. None was moved, okay? So it took 50 iterations, because, well, sure it would, right? But that's quite reasonable, I think. So let me just summarize. Um, so with ADMM consensus, you can do machine learning across distributed data sources. I think that's cool. Uh, the data never moves. Now you can see why I'm going to have to pay you that $20, wherever, wherever it was. Uh, um, and the cool part is you get the same model as if you'd collected all the data in one place and then solved it as just one global problem. Um, so let me finish up with just some resources for this. Um, if you want to learn about convex optimization, you go to Google and you type in convex optimization, and you'll find plenty of stuff. If you don't, I, you'll find plenty of stuff. I mean, there's books, courses, slides, lectures, all sorts of crazy software, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, OK, so everything's available uh, on, on, online for that. And I'll, I'll go back uh, to this. And actually, I'm going to wrap up here. So I'm, I'm done. And then uh, the good news is we'll have plenty of time for questions and stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. So if we could start to pass out the quizzes, that'd be uh, all right. So oh, yeah. questions. We. Yes. Professor, you actually, there's one piece missing, like if you can divide the features, is that right? Yeah, that's it right. It is on your lecture notes, too. Yeah, that's right. So you can also, what I've shown here is something that seems kind of natural, which is uh, dividing the examples into groups. Um, but you can also divide, you can divide features into groups, and it'll work, uh, you can do something similar. That's true. Uh, so. What's the price to pay for additional fragmentation? Is cutting it up in a thousand pieces going to, instead of a hundred, going to cost me more iterations to converge? But yes. I, I will get to the same point. Yes. So. so that's a great point. And I have to tell you, unlike some of the stuff I showed in the middle with the, you know, the Huber stuff, uh, this is sort of ongoing research. But actually, the honest answer to that question is, at the moment, no one knows. We're working on it. But yes, what, what I would presume would happen is that if you chop it into a thousand pieces. Uh, the, well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is to solve each piece is going to be faster. The bad news is going to be more iterations. So, and the answer is we really don't know what the right grain size is or anything. And is any shred of, yeah. is there any shred in this that's explaining why random forests work in the worst in the first place? Because also there we do, uh, we that's work good, off of different data sets. No, you know, no, sure. In some sense, that's, a, that's a great question. And actually, I don't know is the answer. I could pretend to know, but it's, it's, being, it's, it's being recorded. So if it, if it weren't, I would for sure pretend to know. And I would say, oh, yes, I believe that explains it. But OK. Yeah. Um. Oh, uh, two questions. So yes. uh, first on the Huber one, so I'm guessing at some point when, you, when the variance of your noise that you're adding mm -hmm. becomes too big so that the flip probability P is mm -hmm. relatively small compared to, to mm -hmm. that tail, uh, least square would do better than Huber. So in your, yes. in your searches, where did you see that uh, kind of sweet spot? Right, so let's go back over here to Huber, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the question is essentially, how do you choose M here, right? Yeah. Well, OK, the correct answer, which is also the correct answer to pretty much any question anybody could ever ask, is by cross-validation. I believe that's the answer to everything. But So that would be the case here. Uh, but there are very good ways to choose M. I mean, you might choose it as, depending on what you look at the histogram of your, your, uh, of, of your um, 
uh, outcomes, and you might put it at the 90th percentile, the 75th, and then which one of those it is is going to be. You're going to let uh, cross validation determine. Okay. Um, was that your question? Uh, that's good. Yeah. Good I mean, certainly, if I make right. m really big, this is just least squares, for sure. Yeah. Right. And if I make m really small, this is basically like L1, right? And so this mm -hmm. is something yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Um, second question on the on the constitutional uh, optimization stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. this is probably kind of not what you were shooting for with the distributed data problem. Yeah. But um, uh, there's the, 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 the lost data problem uh, where mm -hmm. uh, you had some data some time ago and you could train a model, but then it's you can only store so many petabytes. That's it. Throw that away. You great. take some more. Okay. Now, because you are iterating, this does not exactly work on the lost data problem. Is there anything, yeah. anything that can be done? No. So the answer is yes, and that's actually a great application of this, right? So uh, there's two ways to say it. Um, one is if you want to forget data, right? So what you do is you run this this thing in uh, warm start mode. Warm start mode. So the whole point about that is that so let's say you and I are gonna. You've got a giant data set. I've won two. And the whole point is we're just going to exchange methods with the messages with this high-level protocol. I don't care what your data is, right? And so what will happen is if, you, if a new day goes by and you forget some data that was, you know, whatever, a month, you know, two months ago and, and therefore decided to, we've decided it's stale, then all that will happen is we'll run a few more iterations and update our model. So you can actually do that quite nicely. Uh, and that's, that's a perfect application of this is to run it uh, warm start. Yeah. So I, did I get your question? I, I missed that. Sorry, I, I can't hear it. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Question. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry, you're you're being 25 decibels overruled. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so the the data that was missed, uh, how mm -hmm. do you iterate? Uh, it, it, it won't be oh, able to when you get, when get you the... when you do stuff like put a fading fading memory or you decide to drop some data, all the changes is your loss function. Right? And then we, you and I will iterate. It might have taken us 10 iterations to get a good, good global model. We'll do one or two iterations, and we'll, we'll be back again in, in coherence, even though you just dropped a week of data because it's now thought to be stale. Right? So that's a perfect application. Yes. Uh, in your last uh, subject, the consensus regression yeah. and, and modeling, and if it's in, say, in the Hadoop case where the data are more or less mm -hmm. Random, you know, and then I can see that it work would work really well, mm -hmm. and and that will be very efficient. But if, say, I am uh, the data or the behavior or, or whatever the the model, they're very different, mm -hmm. and then would that result in just more iterations, or actually at some point it may fail? Okay. because that was a great, yeah, great question. Two parts of a question. And I'm really glad you. Uh, asked it. So the first question is, you know, if you, do, if you let's say, hash the data when I divide it up, um, compared to what happens if the data is like weird and heterogeneous? Let's do a medical study or let's do fraud detection, and one server has got a, a bunch of has got a bunch of data where fraud doesn't happen that much, and another server has it where it's a lot. Actually, what's weird about that is that works better than you think. Um, of course, if you hash everything so that everybody just sees a smaller sample, it's going to work unbelievably well. It's going to be all over in two iterations or three or something, right? But it turns out even in this case where the data is highly skewed, it works very well. Um, so that's, that's, that's something that's been observed about this. The, let me go back to the first one. You said that when you run this on Hadoop, it might be, I mean, it was hashing, but you said that this would work well. Actually, it works terribly um, <laughs> in this case. Uh, so, and I think that's not really the point of it. Um, I think the point of uh, this is not, I mean, it fits perfectly with like MapReduce or something, right? It's like you have everybody fits their model and then you collect everything and then you, you know, it's just, it's perfect, right? And you can code it up and like, I don't know, not, not much. It won't work very well because of actually the data movement. Um, so I actually think that the sweet spot in applications is exactly what was discussed at the very end of the last talk, which is that you've got a bunch of data stores sitting on some pretty big data. And you do not feel like or cannot collect all the data in one place. And what this is saying is you don't need to. You just, if, each, if each data store has something on top that supports one method, 
then there's a simple protocol that will actually do data modeling as if you had collected all the data together, but you didn't. So I think what I else? answered your questions in a little bit more. <laughs> no. What else do we have? We still have time. I would, all right, we got one in the back. Hey, um, I have a couple questions. The first is, um, if you had a non-convex problem mm -hmm. that you just fed into one of those open source convex solvers you're talking about, yep. uh, would it return an error, or would it find a local minimum, or what would happen? That is a great question. So it depends on the method. Uh, in some cases, it's impossible to even send in, like if it's a cone program. It's impossible to, you can't even specify a non-convex program, right? So it depends on the interface to the function, right? Weirdly, this consensus stuff, you can do with non-convex functions. And then I think the most accurate technical statement is the following, uh, something happens. Uh, Maybe good, it might converge to a local minimum. With the right tweaking, it, uh, it does. Uh, usually, can, and that's actually some research that some of us, uh, including Stephen, are actively uh, looking at. Um, and there it looks like it's actually really, it's a really interesting method to, so, to approximately solve non-convex problems, right? So that's, so the point is no one really knows. Uh, but people do it, and interesting things happen, and sometimes useful things happen. Thanks. Um, and then, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, uh, what was my second question? <laughs> um, have you ever thought about or attempted on the consensus optimization to, instead of just the global average of the models, to take some kind of weighted average where suppose you have you know one data store that appears to be more accurate of the global population, right. like as a higher weight? That's or? a great question. There are variations where you would you do a, a weighted average and the algorithm will work, it, it will work. Um, and in fact, there are cases where that will actually make it run much faster. Now, one thing you don't have to do here is uh, if you have like one data store has just 100 examples and another one has a million, that's taken care of automatically because what, what you're not minimizing is average loss but total loss at each node. If you did average loss, you'd be in deep, deep trouble there, right? So, uh, so yes, there are methods to change this that way and people do it and sometimes it's good. But in a lot of cases, it just works just the way it is. If you just, if you literally do exactly what that algorithm says, it's gonna work. Okay, um, so I think that last slide you showed, you showed that, uh, or the slide with the, you know, basically you don't need to get to the end to the optimal solution to have go. a good enough solution. Oh yeah, okay, um, it, it's more clear <laughs> here. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, so given that, you know, one of the classic criticisms of Neural networks. Is mm -hmm. There's suboptimal solutions. Oh, good. Solutions. We went this far until yeah. the neural network word came up. I'm, yeah, I'm, I apologize. I'm in advance. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. That's great. I'm glad it did. So, I'm just surprised it took this long. Um, go ahead and say it. Interesting. Just, could you just to interrupt your questions? Just go ahead and say it. Just say deep neural network. Go ahead well, and say it. It could, it could, it could be one hidden layer. One, okay, one okay. hidden layer right, is sufficient. Fine. Go one, on with your question. Go one, on with your question. Right, right. One, okay, fine. Um, so is it interesting? to have a, or would it be interesting for you to have um, some sort of architecture or, mm -hmm. or you know, setup where you have a convex mm -hmm. uh, error function? Is that interesting in your opinion? Um, well, actually, I mean, if I understood the question, I mean, this is actually part of what we're interested in doing is actually making protocols uh, so that in fact, I don't even, not only that, I don't even have to know what your function is and we can just connect things together and then say, you guys deal with it, and then it means the whole problem will be solved automatically, right? So uh, we are working on, on that kind of stuff, so we are. That's if I got the question right, and I'm not well, sure I did. Well, so, so quite often the solutions that are found in state-of-the-art systems are probably suboptimal. Oh, okay, so, sure. So, and no, with, and not, for, not, not when you're solving a convex problem. Right, but, but in neural networks, they're probably right. suboptimal. Okay, so yeah, sure. Not sh so would, they're not and, probably, they are. <laughs> They definitely, they most likely yeah. are, right. But by the way, for the same reason as, uh, if we go back to the slide for a minute here, uh, if you could just go back to the slide here. For the same reason as this, it's not that big a deal, right? So, right. But, yeah. So, so, so do, do you think optimality would actually make state-of-the-art neural networks even better, or, um, and, or is, is that kind of you know a big thing to? I, I don't know, but yeah. I, I doubt it. I have a lot of friends who do deep neural networks, and 
I mean, I, my suspicion is they wouldn't get a lot better. It's kind of like this, right? I mean, if you were to stop here and say, uh, stop here and say, oh, that's it, and they'd say, hey, you did a really crappy job of minimizing that loss plus regularizer. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but I already got a perfectly good model. Um, I, so my suspicion is that it wouldn't improve much, right? Awesome. Then that's just as well, because now what I'm going to tell you is, I mean, the question I was hope I was trying to ask you to ask was, you know, hey, this is great. How do you use this for, you know, deep neural networks? <laughs> how do you of, use it? <laughs> can you just go ahead and ask it then? Well, how, how do we use it, and what's the right package? That's a great yeah. question. Uh, okay. So, and the answer is, I really don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. So. All right, two more. We got one here. Navdeep, is, are there any in the back? Hi. So for consensus modeling, in a situation like pharmaceutical research, a lot yes. of times there's benefit to combine data without giving up their own IP. And part of the problem is, even if they intend to, they're not necessarily actually measuring the same thing. Can, can you use consensus modeling to form a consensus that you throw out a couple of these guys See, that would, that would actually be kind of, I mean, that would be a kind of a cool application. I mean, but I'm, I, I stay away from that area because it just looks just too much, too many lawyers, too, uh, lots of stuff, too many regulators. But uh, still, I, that would seem to me to be where this would be very valuable, right? That if I was sitting on a bunch of medical data, and so are you. And, but we don't, all, what we would do is we'd exchange messages. Um, now, my colleagues say that if I exchange enough messages with you, I will actually be able to find out some of your data, right? But the key is that we do this 10, 15 times, and there's no way that I can find out your data, you know, anything about your data. Of course, both of us will know what the global model is. So I can, I can look. Looking at the global model, I can say, well, it must be that you have a lot more diabetes type 2 patients. That's just from this model, so right? If, if I to change, yeah. Else, so oh, yeah, you could do, yeah, okay. So actually, I'm glad you brought that up. The question was if you wanted to cheat, if you're running consensus, you want to cheat just to find out other people's models, could you do that? And the answer is yes, you could do that. So this is not what people call a competitive. This is not an adversarial uh, algorithm. It's not an algorithm that plays well with adversaries, right? So the, the presumption is if we invite you in to do consensus modeling with us, you are faithfully executing your part of it, privately but faithfully. We do have ways to check it, but you could still cheat. OK, we got one more. So, so you showed um, same algorithm, multiple bits of data to combine them together? Have Sorry, an algorithm with what? So the, the, the main algorithm you showed was uh, different data, but the same algorithm, and then they reach a consensus. That's right. Have you looked at doing like an ensemble method where it's the same data, different algorithms? Uh, do you mean different models or something? Yeah, like that? yeah. So you train like yeah. four very different models, but on um, the same data. Right. So you, this, there is some connection between this and ensemble methods. And I'm, to be honest, I don't really know the connections. I, I can say this. Um, Ensemble methods in the context of convex, convex optimization problems is really boring. Um, and let me tell you why. Because the whole point of convexity is that when I average things, they get better. Uh, so that's why if, I, if everybody had their own little, you know, and if we're solving a convex problem, everybody has their own theta, when I average them, that model is better than all of, than, than, than all in each of the individuals, right? And I don't think, I think the whole point of ensemble is that these are all quite, they're all different, right? These are different tree, decision trees and stuff like that, and then you combine them. So, so it's a great question, and I actually, honestly, I don't really know the answer, uh, except that ensemble methods and convex optimization are kind of boring, um, and it is probably related to, in some way to uh, ensemble methods. All right, great. So. How about another hand for our speaker? Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks.